you said you know what we have need of even before we ask it. God, I pray over every sickness, every pain, every disease, every finance, God, every situation that was mentioned in this place right now. God, that you would begin to move in them, oh Lord. We're Pentecostal. We didn't come into this place tonight, God, to just sit on a pew. But we come to magnify you. We come to praise you. We come to exalt you. We come to claim, God, every promise that you've given us. And we pray that you move upon every need and situation in this place. God, we're going to magnify you. We're going to praise you. And we're going to lift up the name that is above every name. God, that at the mention of that name, God, every devil in hell is going to know, God, that you are alive and well. God, that you're touching and moving in this place. And we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise as we're headed back to our seats tonight. Pat somebody on the back and tell them it's good to have them in the house of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated in the house tonight. I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm glad to be here. What a mighty God we serve, Brother Buck. He's been good to me. Been a great day. Thankful. Blessed. Woke up this morning, had breath in my lungs, able to get out of bed. I got a lot to praise God for, Brother Terrence. I'm able to be in the house of the Lord tonight with you great people to magnify him and praise him for everything he's doing in my life. Amen. And I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. If you will, Sister Scarlett, let's give them the ways to give tonight. We have Givelify and PayPal available at riverbendpentecostals.com. You can send your cash and checks to be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. There's also text to give, which is 833-883-9311. As you can see, you can do the old-fashioned way. The wood pans are for offering, and the gold pans are for tithing. Amen? If you'd all stand, we're going to go before the Lord and pray this prayer. We're going to pray it with faith. Amen? Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Even though we can't see it, we know He's working, and we're believing. Amen? So if you will, pray this prayer with me tonight. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'm a tither, and I give my offerings, and I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, Benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprise, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I'm blessed going in and I'm blessed going out and all that I do will prosper in Jesus name. And the church said, amen. amen. God bless you. Come and give with what God has blessed you with. Well, the king told Daniel not to pray to his God anymore. Well, I'll lock you in the lion's den and throw away the key to the door. But the very next day found Daniel down on his bended knee. The difference this time he opened the blinds so the whole wide world could see. I don't care what you say.
Aren't you glad for that right you have to pray? Come on, let's give him a hand clap of praise and thank him for this opportunity. We didn't have to give it to us, but he gave it to us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. You may be seated in the house tonight. Me and Sister Ashley is going to be in the back with these babies tonight. And I'm going to miss this last lesson, but I thank God that we've got online church. So I can go back and watch it. Because I don't want to miss it, but I'm going to have to, Brother Ronnie. All right, if all of you Riverbend kids would come. I don't know how many we're going to have tonight. Some of them is at camp, and I know they're having a blast. Well, hello, Bo. Hey, how are you? All right, that's what I'm talking about. All right, Riverbend Ignited. They'll come on back or come on up. Before they go back, we're fixing to pray for these babies. Amen. Amen. How many of y'all believe prayer works? I hope you do. I know I do because Brother Cody, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for it. Amen. It's only by the mercy and the grace of God that I am who I am and I am where I am today. He didn't have to do it, but he did. And I'm so thankful. We can all stand in the house tonight. Lift your hands toward these children. We're going to pray for them right now before they go back. Dear Lord, we love you and we thank you. We praise you for each and every one of them, God. These children are a gift from you, Lord. They're a promise that you've given us. God, they're not just the future generation. They're today's generation, Lord. God, and then when they leave this place, God, every single day that they live, everybody that they come in contact with, Lord, we pray a hand of protection and hedge about them. God, that you would use them, that you would bless them, that you would keep them, and that you would strengthen them, Lord. I pray, God, that you would help them to realize, Lord, that they don't have to wait till they get old to be used of you, but they can be used of you right now. God, I read in your word many times, oh, Lord, where you use children, you use young men and women, oh, Lord, and you're able to do it right now. And I pray that you strengthen them, that you encourage them, and that you bless them. Let your hand of protection be upon them as they leave this place. And we're going to magnify you and praise you and thank you for it. Because you are worthy, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Let's give him a hand clap of praise as they head to the back tonight. Amen. I am thankful for these children. Y'all pray for me and Sister Ashley strengthen the Lord tonight. Good looking group of young ones. Amen. Well, I like what I feel in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. A great spirit here. Brother Larry texted me and said, would it be stupid if we prayed over the ladies at church? I said, if the Lord told you to do it, let's do it. Really what I was thinking is, if the Lord says do it and we don't, it's stupid. You be seated. God bless you for standing. And... Uh, this is lesson six. We had an introduction and then five lessons on be not deceived. And this is the, I don't really know what I'm going to call it. Uh, this is the lesson that gave birth to all the others. This is where I was in the Bible when the Lord began to speak to me. And uh, I... Uh, I will tell you, since I started teaching this series, there's been a few times where I felt like asking the Lord, are you sure that I'm doing the right thing? Because the devil has, the enemy and the flesh have been all working together. And, uh, but I know, that's why I know that it's right. And uh, the devil will let you 
say a whole lot of stuff that don't mean anything as long as you're not helping anybody. But when somebody starts growing, somebody starts gaining ground, the devil's got to get involved. And please don't for one second think the devil and all his imps isn't real. That's the, I read the other day, that's the biggest lie he tries to get people to believe is that he doesn't exist. And uh, he is the accuser, the enemy, the deceiver, and uh, he's after us. We're going to be in Galatians 6 tonight. Um, and I'm going to get done. Well, that depends. Yeah, I'm going to get done tonight. I'm not quitting till we get there. Um, it won't be long. It won't be long. But after my morning devotion today, which I'm going to reference in this, and then what Brother Shannon sent um, to a couple of us later in the day, uh, I know for a fact I'm in the will of God. I am very nervous that uh, this is, you probably never heard this taught before, at least some parts of it. I know I've never taught it before, and I've never heard it taught before, but uh, I, uh, I hope that we leave here different than we came. Every last one of us. Galatians 6 contains some of my favorite passages in Scripture. Verse number 1 tells us the responsibility that the spiritual have. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. I love that verse because I feel like I have both gained and are benefited and been able to give restoration to people uh, because of that passage. And then verse 4 tells us how to get deliverance from seeking to please people and searching for their accolades. And the, way, the answer is do it for the Lord because it's the right thing. And then you'll have rejoicing in yourself alone and not in another. And then verse number 9, which is part of tonight's lesson, I love it. Verse Chapter 6 and verse 9 says, Be not weary in well-doing. For in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Now, this is a fitting conclusion, as it were. If this was an opus or a composition, Sister Maria, I feel like we would be ending on a high note because I think this is a crescendo that comes at the conclusion. Now, 2 Corinthians 11 and 3 in the New King James Version is where we started this, and it says, But I fear lest by any means that you as the serpent, I'm, I'm quoting the King James, but this is in the new King James. He said, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds, everybody say my mind. My mind. That's what he's after. All right. May be corrupted from the simplicity of, that is in Christ, as the serpent deceived Eve. The fear, as unsavory and co as that concept may be, I don't like it. I don't like being afraid, okay? I don't like scary stories. I don't like scary movies. I don't like scary songs. I don't like reading Edgar Allan Poe. Don't like being scared. Does nothing for me, okay? But I am afraid. Because I know of the enemy's desire and ability to deceive. And it scares me. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 5 in the New Living Translation said, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. But when it says they no longer will, we know once they did. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you, speaking to this young pastor, leader, minister, you should keep a clear mind in every situation. 
Hear me as I tell you, deception isn't reserved only for those hearing the preaching. He's also after the ones doing the preaching. We are just as susceptible. So keep your mind clear. Keep your head clear. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. I copied and pasted this next portion right out of the first lesson. Paul's warning to Timothy. Their deception can become Timothy's distraction, which gives birth to his own deception, which is their struggle is now my focus. And as we follow these deceived believers, we lose sight of where we were headed. And now we are led by the flesh, theirs and ours, instead of the spirit. And it feels like we're doing the right thing. But the truth is we're being led astray. Remember the illustration I did in elements class with my wife and myself? That's the story. I can chase her in her problems. And Sister Maria, we're going to both find ourselves off the path and wrong. And I am convinced that is one of the greatest deceptions facing the church today is I feel like I'm doing the right thing, chasing somebody who's already deceived. And so now we both become deceived by the same thing. Galatians 6 and 7. Be not deceived. We've learned throughout this series that that directive is to us. It's our responsibility to not be deceived. Right? God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The focus, here's where I'm starting to get a little scared. Because this is some, this is some toe stomping stuff tonight. I look at Brother Jerry because he claims I step on his toes every service, uh, and Brother Ronnie does too. One of them's right. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just teasing. <laughs> the focus or the emphasis of this deception is perhaps the most dangerous one. Because it's not talking about the devil deceiving you, but it's talking about you deceiving yourself. Self-deception. In this context, to be better understood as self-deception, don't let yourself deceive yourself. God is not mocked. Now, this is kind of funny when I read it, but I really think it's meant this way. The word from which mocked is translated, comes from the Greek word, and I actually looked up how to pronounce this, muk terizo. And that word, which you're not going to mean, it's not going to mean anything to you yet, finds its roots in the word muk aomei, Greek words. And here's what that word literally means. Snout. As that which lowing proceeds. It's this that comes out of the cow and the hog. It's really talking about a snout. Okay? Now, the literal definition, remember, God is not mocked. The literal definition is to turn up the nose in a sign of contempt, to scornfully disdain or contemptuously reject. And I feel like, I feel like that using the word snout for the nose is intentional by the Apostle Paul because of how silly it is to behave this way. Now, please understand before you start thinking about folks that you have seen behave this way, 
That's not who the word's talking about. But the ones you've never seen do it. The context of this scripture lends itself not to outward acts or a literal sneering or showing contempt in rejection, but it's actually what's going on in the heart, who you really are. The truth is, these people are showing all the right outward signs, but the warning of this scripture speaks to their inward state. Now, the pulpit commentary, I, I'm quoting this exactly, and then I'm going to break it down because I really couldn't understand it until I did. But it says, here's what that means. Let nothing lead you astray from the conviction that in the conformity of your real aims and actual practice with the dictates of God's Spirit, and in that alone can you hope for eternal life. Now, I'm paraphrasing it. Here's what that's saying. Don't let anything creep into your heart and sway you from the conviction that your real purpose and the actions leading you to that purpose come from being led by the Spirit of God and nothing else. You're not going to find your way anyway aside from being led by the Spirit. Wherein you have the hope of being saved and going to heaven to be with the Lord. If you come any other way, you're the same as a thief and a robber. And let me tell you what the Lord's going to do. You know what he's going to do? Dismiss you. Because, because there came in one to the wedding who had not on a wedding garment. And they said to him, what are you doing here improperly attired? And he was speechless. There's no excuse. When we stand before God, there is no excuse. We, have to, we cannot allow anything to creep into our life that will take us away or take us to any notion that there is a way to excel, succeed, and be saved aside from the leading of the Spirit. It doesn't exist. But self-deception says it does. There's an underlying, here we go. There is an underlying theme that speaks to the dangers of this deception being that when you live a lie for so long, you come to think you're right. That you, hear me now, that you've become so good at outward religion, saying the right things, going to the right places, dressing the right way, etc., that you've come to think that your way is right and that you are good, even though on the inside you're thumbing your nose at God. The purpose of the book of Galatians is to cry a warning. It's a warning from two directions. One warning is from their past, primarily referring to the spirit and the attitude reflected in their conversion experience and the early days of their walk with God. He calls them, Sister Maria, from the place when they were new converts. When they loved everybody, they loved everything, they obeyed everything, they were submitted, they were just glad to be a part of it. And then he calls them from their future, which is in doubt if they don't revert back to being like they were in their past. They somehow have left the innocence of the new birth behind, and they have begun to make their own way, and if they don't make some changes in their life, they're not going to end up where they started headed to Make sense? Okay. How does your past compare and contrast with your present, spiritually speaking? Are you closer to God today than you were? Do you read the word more than you did? Do you pray more than you did? The answer to that question your future depends on it. Amen. 
I know good, good well I'm in the Holy Ghost right now. If you have begun to be more like the world and less like Jesus Christ, you're not headed in a good direction. But it feels like you are. A part of Paul's dilemma coincides with this is that the negative influences coming against the church have given birth to pride. Pride that elevates personal thinking above the word and will of God. The truth is, if the word says it, what you think doesn't matter if it conflicts with it. Galatians 3 and 3 Paul said to this church, his cry unto them is, Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Now here's the truth. No one has ever truthfully received the baptism of the Holy Ghost when fueled by carnality. Ever. Ever. You came and was filled with the baptism of the, I feel him right now. You came and were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost because you submitted yourself to the word of God completely. You repented of your sins, you're baptized in Jesus' name, and you received the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. That's how it happened in Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19, and that's how it happened to us. All right? that The new birth. And if you don't get born again of the water and spirit, you ain't going to see the kingdom of heaven and you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay? They began in the spirit. I know what Paul preached to them. He said, and to them, in chapter number one, this is the group that Paul said to them, even if an angel from heaven come preaching another message, don't believe him because it's a lie. The message is the same from the beginning. But then, he said, are you now made perfect or matured or brought to completion in the flesh? Here's the way I picture this. As if the perfecting or completing power of God looks to our own fleshly wants and desires in order to customize the work of the Spirit in us. It's as if, what he's asking them, it's as if that we went to the Lord and said, I want that color interior, I want that color paint, I want that color on top, I want them kind of wheels, and I want that, and I'll make it work in me. No, that's not how he works. Are you understanding what I'm saying? He said, you began in the spirit. How was that? How did that happen? What'd you say? completely submitted to God, but now you're going to arrive at perfection according to your flesh. He said, do you really think that's how it's going to work? The reason why this is foolish is because the standard by which we are measured is Jesus Christ. And in Micah chapter 6 and verse 3, he says, I am the Lord and I change not. And Hebrews 13 and 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. That's who we're trying to be like. He is the end of the law to everyone that believeth. We're certainly not measured by our personal preferences. And sure enough, not the world we live in. Finishing verse 7, he says, am I connecting all right? Is everybody with me? I mean, really, are you with me? Because I don't want to move on. Because this is potent now. This is some powerful stuff. And it has the potential to make or break you. For whatsoever a man soweth, I'm in verse 7 still, that shall he also reap. Here's this unavoidable truth. You can have whatever you want in life. As far as lifestyle choices, you can do whatever you want and that will never go away. There will never come a time in your life when you cannot choose to do whatever you want. 
God will never force you to follow him. Never. You can have them completely unfettered and unrestrained by the limits of the will and the word of God. You can get out of this word and do whatever you want to forever. Any way, any time, anyhow. But please be aware of the consequences. There will always be a harvest season that follows the planting. Proverbs 29 and 18 in the New Living Translation. You're very familiar with it in the King James Version, but the New Living Translation really is plain. It says, when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. You might know that better as where there's no vision, the people perish. When people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. When does joy come? In the harvest. In the harvest. There is an unavoidable harvest that will be reaped when one lives only in the moment. Ironically enough, when you sow wild oats, you will also have to reap them. You can't sow wild oats and reap good ones. The law of sowing and reaping cannot be violated. Here's where I was when the Lord began to deal with me about this message. This is a revelation of the motivating moment, if you please, of this entire series. In our lives, the actions of yesterday are being reaped today. The Bible clearly states, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. I don't care how right you look, act, and behave. If you are not right on the inside, it will show up. And the most common place it's going to show up is under your roof. And when the abundance of a heart full of bitterness and strife and continued rebellion incurring the favor of an unsubmitted spirit reveling in gossip and criticism and raising your family under the cloud of a victim mentality, when all of that is planted, it cannot but show up in harvest time. I will challenge us all today. I have heard this. I brought them to church. I raised them right. I trained them right. And now they're not like that anymore. So I did everything I could. Did you? Did you? What exactly was planted in their life that's being reaped now? I'm smiling because I'm afraid I'm about to cry. It was this picture that I saw. I want to let you know something. I, in this same scenario, have been blamed for young people that have been lost who were lost before I ever became pastor. Is that silly? Absolutely it's silly, but it's completely understandable because it's got to be somebody else's fault. It's got to be somebody else's problem. When the truth of the matter is there is no one on this earth that influences our family more than we do. Galatians 6 and 8. For he that soweth, everybody with me? This is not hopeless. We're going to get there. Just be ready. Sunday morning. 
Sunday morning, we opened the service with prayer. I'm going to challenge you. Coming up this next Sunday, we start at 11 o'clock. Be ready to start. Don't be playing. Don't be laughing, talking, making your plans for evening lunch. Get locked in on the service. Because we were about half connected when the service began Sunday morning. You cannot avoid the sowing process. That's what's happening when you're laughing at prayer time. When you're distracted at prayer time. For he that soweth, I'm fixing to unpack all of that. Just get ready. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Who's this letter written to? So you say it out loud. You don't have to whisper. To the church. To the churches in Galatia. It's not written to the world, but to the church. Whomever plants seeds in life, every word you say, it's a seed. Say, I don't know about that. I do. Because you know what the seed is that come from heaven? It's what? The word. I said this Sunday, but I mean it tonight, honey. Be ready to make a run for it. If you see me break toward the door, just come go with me. <laughs> Whomever plants seeds with the intent of pleasing the flesh shall reap that which is fleshly. And everything that's fleshly is dying. Whomever plants seeds with the intent of pleasing the Spirit shall reap that which lives forever, that which is spiritual, because Spirit is life. So here's the important question. Where does my motivation come from? Or here's the better question. Am I doing or am I being? Doing, uh, Holy Ghost, I need you to help me right now. If I am doing, I'm doing it because it's all about the reward. I'm sowing this seed in order to reap the personal benefits. But if I am being, it's never about me, but always about him. You with me? Making sense? Think about this. This is from my, my devotional. You think this wasn't heaven? They showed up at the right time. When you ask a child... What do you want to be when you grow up? They will say a fireman, a policeman, an astronaut, a movie star, a football player, a singer, or even a preacher. They didn't really answer the question you asked. What do you want to be when you grow up? They didn't tell you what they wanted to be they told you what they wanted to do. Because astronaut, fireman, movie star, football player, preacher, singer, dancer, all of those things, that's not who they are. That's what they do. Each of those things is established by the actions that accompany their vocation. 
This devotional I'm reading is called The Uncommon Life by Tony Dungy. In order to prove his point, he, speaking of his coach in the NFL, Tony Dungy was a former NFL player and a Super Bowl winning coach. He spoke of his NFL head coach named Chuck Noll, and he said this, I never heard Chuck Noll act as if his value as a person was lessened when we lost a game. He was the same person whether we were winning or losing because his self-esteem did not depend on what he accomplished. And when he retired from football, he did not lose his identity because his identity was based on something deeper than being a coach. What he did didn't define who he was. The same thing applies when our identity, and I'm in back in GL preaching now, the same thing applies when our identity becomes permanently attached to things we have. Houses, cars or trucks, even clothes, even relationships can be a result of sowing to our flesh. It becomes who we are. Ladies and gentlemen, as a child of God, as a Bible-believing Christian, you and I better have nothing that is not expendable for the kingdom. But I'm going to take it to another level now. The same thing can be applied in this manner. Sowing to the flesh means that I pray for someone because I want them to know I'm spiritual. And when they don't get healed, I get mad at God because he made me look bad. Or I feel like I let them down or I didn't have enough faith or I shouldn't have listened or should have listened or something and what I have done is made the work of the Lord all about me. And I'll bet you a hundred dollar bill, please excuse the carnal reference, that there is nobody in here that has ever thought that I can be praying for somebody and sowing to the flesh. But I believe you can. Hmm. Hmm. When I'm so into the spirit, I pray for them because I am a man or a woman of faith. And I am submitted, Brother Ronnie, to the word of God. Say, you said the Bible says you're supposed to pray for people? Well, absolutely, Mark chapter 16. And these signs shall follow them that believe. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But when I'm so into the spirit, I pray for them because I am a man or woman of faith and I am submitted to the word of God and in fact to the spirit of God. If they don't get healed, it doesn't mean that I'm no longer a man or woman of faith. My motivation determines the destination of the seed that I'm sowing. Why am I doing this? Am I doing it because I want reward or am I doing it because that's who I am? Is this all right, Sister Maria? Is it? Somebody got their hand up? Go right ahead. Absolutely. It's all about me. And it is impossible to be all about me and pleasing to him at the same time. Impossible. Yes, sir. What would you just say? Well, I will let that slide. What would you say right before that? It's none of my business what the outcome is. 
if I'm simply submitted to the Lord. I have been called to pray for the sick. It's what believers do. I don't heal people. He does. And if he chooses not to heal them, Ronnie, that's not my business. Who else had their hand up? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Right. Right. A- absolutely, and you're you're so right in that. You're so right in that. But the deception is, if you continue so long in doing, please hear me when I tell you. Nothing has happened because all you reap from doing is death. I, what I reap from being is being in alignment with him. Okay? Because you know who I am? I'm a child of God. I am an ambassador on earth for Jesus Christ. I I can have no other identity. Because sometimes, Brother Derek, I'm going to stop at Burger King and God's going to choose to work through a dump truck driver who's full of the, a man who's full of the Holy Ghost who happens to drive a dump truck. But that's not who he is. He is a child of God. Filled with the Holy Ghost for the purpose of being a conduit of the Spirit. And I got to be willing because, Sister Leanne, if I'm in the Holy Ghost and I lay hands on you and God plans on healing you, but I got some ego problems, I guarantee you he ain't going to heal you right then. He's going to heal you when I'm out of the way. So he sure enough gets the glory. Because if he heals you right then and I got the wrong motivation, I'm going to take the glory. And I guarantee you I'm going to tell everybody I can about it. I'm probably going to buy me a van and put GL's healing ministry on the side of it. And then all I want to reap is dollars and cents. Okay, please understand, the sowing of spiritual seed for fleshly purposes results in a corrupt harvest. That word corrupt means decomposing. It's already dying. Verse 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing. Why would I get weary in well-doing? Oh, that's, that sounds good, but why? You're close. You're very close. But why? Why? That's, that's preacher speak. Okay, that, that's, that's Holy Ghost speak. The truth is... It's all dead or dying. Look at here, okay? You were right on target. You just didn't go all the way. The only reason I would get weary of well-doing is I was always doing it for the wrong reason. I am doing it for fleshly reasons rather than spiritual. Look at here. Yes, ma'am. Do you think that's why a lot of people sometimes get taken away from being thankful? Because of not being in alignment with him? You know, you're just going to do things. 
I think that's why some of us have been in a waiting season for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. It's because we were just going through the motions of doing instead of being. And we prayed for somebody 45 years ago and they didn't get healed and we've been scared to do it ever since because it was all about me. But what I came into the room tonight to teach us is your story ain't over. I came to tell you that, Brother Shannon, there's an opportunity for a turnaround right now, just as fast as Matthew's was. Yes, ma'am. Y'all better be watching what Shelly says because she's been cutting loose with some stuff. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Close. Yeah. Uh huh. But but we've learned that's a beautiful thing. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. Because let me tell you what the Word says. He's given us everything we need to live life and to live it in a godly manner. Everything we need, it's in there. So let me tell you something, Sister Shelley. You just keep on coming around. And Revelation is fixing to cut loose. Because when you get in alignment, here's what it aligns into a conduit where heaven can flow into your life. Yes. Yes. And, it, and he does that. And that's part of the reason why when I feel the Holy Ghost right now, boy, I feel it, I got goosebumps on my kneecaps. Uh, the reason why the Holy Ghost has struggled to be loosed among us for so long is we did instead of being. Yes. And if I am being, Brother Ronnie, Brother Shannon, I don't even worry about outcomes because the book says I plant and I water, but God gives the increase. You know what that's talking about? The harvest. You know why I'm harvesting of the flesh? It's because I'm planting, I'm watering, and I'm harvesting. Uh -uh. Y'all ain't going to believe this, but I'm almost done. <laughs> See, when I'm weary in well-doing, I get upset because I don't get enough recognition for what I did. I don't get enough benefits for what I did. Nobody's talking about what I did. There's nothing in it for me. And right now, I'm not willing to wait or I don't have the faith to wait on God, so I'm going to make it happen, bless God. Yeah. I have to make something happen. We only get weary in well-doing if it's done for the wrong reason from the wrong place. And Brother Blake, we talked about it before church, what the Holy Ghost does to us. And Brother Blake's talked about it and other people have talked about it, that you get to a place where you can't really pray and you can't really help nobody and you can't really do nothing, but you just keep on trying. And you know what the Holy Ghost is trying to tell you to do? Time out. Go somewhere and sleep. Now listen, y'all going to think this is sacrilegious, but, but it ain't. I'm the pastor. I got this from heaven. I told Brother Blake a while ago, sorry for divulging a private conversation, but I told Brother Blake a while ago, it is okay to sometimes wake up on Saturday morning and you don't read your Bible and you don't take time to pray and you don't spend all this effort and energy trying to just go keep doing what you've been doing. But you get in the truck and you go for a ride somewhere and you give God an opportunity to minister to you. But no, you got to read your Bible and pray every day or you'll die, die, die. No. Jesus Christ himself got away from the crowd to a solitary place and rested. 
You know why we can't rest? Because I got to do. But in the Holy Ghost, I get to be. Oh, I don't know. I hope this is sinking in. I hope this is sinking in. Look at here. The difference is works make you weary. Fruit doesn't. Fruitfulness is organic production. It's being in alignment. The right relationship with the soil, the right relationship with the sun, and the right relationship with the water. Fruit comes. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Here's the deal. Is my blessing is in knowing who I am. Unless I'm a doer and then the only blessing I get is the attaboys. Somebody had a hand up? Sure. I saw yourself being in hand with myself to the Lord's body that you're going to sacrifice. Uh huh. Because if it's all about you and you're not really sacrificing your body, I feel like, or your mind, I feel like it's, I don't feel like it's just your physical body. I feel like it's like your mind and your soul and like your whole being that you need to sacrifice and give to God. That way it's not about you. Uh, yes, yes, you're right. But you have to be careful to not get caught up because we will make the sacrifice be the works. You understand what I'm saying? And the sacrifice is not the works. The sacrifice is me getting in position for God to work through me. Because what is the outcome of that present your body as a living sacrifice? You will, your mind will be transformed and you will prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Okay? So it's all about alignment. The, what the sacrifice is. The sacrifice says, I really want to do this, 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 and this, but that's going to cause me to be out of alignment, so I'm going to give it up so I can stay right here and listen to what God says. And sometimes he says, just sit there and let's enjoy being together. But no, Lord, no, Lord, I got to do. Listen, I've been so, I wrote myself a note on my desk, and I'm listening to it because I said, do not ever call yourself stupid again, all right? So I wrote my, I'm not going to do that. But I have been in the flow of the Holy Ghost five minutes till church starts, and I told the Lord I need to stop what's going on right now so I can go pray before church. Why? Because you got to pray before church or you won't be right with God. It doesn't matter if you're sitting there and all of heaven is just flowing on you right now. I mean, stuff is just, it's almost like the Lord says, do what? <laughs> I mean, really, that has happened in my life because we get so consumed with doing rather than being. And when I be, I know it's bad. I feel the Holy Ghost so strong right now. When I be, I'm okay to sit right here and just be and let somebody else do all the things that get the glory. Listen, there is no limit to what God will do through us if we don't care who gets the credit. And if you are a doer, you can't do it. Because you'll have to tell some. They'll say, look what God did. And you'll say, did it before three times. Yeah. Now what you got? <laughs> but if you're being, you know what you recognize? A kindred spirit. And guess what? Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. Come on, man. Huh? Yeah. Sure. Sure. 
Yep. 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 Let me tell you something. No human being has ever felt that from God. Because the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. So if you're in alignment and you feel condemnation, it's a lie from the devil. And you better resist him. Okay. Somebody got their hand up? Oh, well, okay. Okay. That's right. Yes, it's elementary. It's an elementary. Y'all understand what I mean by elementary? As you understand who you are and who he is, not only are you willing, but you're glad to let him get the glory. Because let me tell you what. I can't handle the glory. Because when the glory comes to me, I like it. And what's more, Kevin, I start believing it. And then when I fail, I say, I got the glory. I'm good. Don't need to repent. Don't need to get things right. Don't need to decrease. I... I you know, God used me. Yeah. It must be okay. Ah. <clears throat> Look at here. Fruitfulness is organic production. Works are forced production. And there's no spirit involved. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. One cannot disregard the way, the will, and the law of God and hope to live. Can't happen. First John 5, 2 through 3. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And this is not a suggestion. This is not advice. This is not an opinion. This is a fact. His commandments are not grievous. You know what that word grievous means? Heavy, weighty, Burdensome, violent, or oppressive. So if you're burdened down by a burden that makes you unable to function, you better ask yourself, am I doing or being? I have to be a child of God. You know what being does if you are told the praise team don't need you anymore? Then you say, tell you something, Buster. You want that spot the next service? Better get here early. Because my identity is not a praise singer. My identity is not even a preacher. My identity is a child of God. That's my identity. And you know something, Brother Cody, when I retire from preaching, I ain't going to retire from preaching. I'm just going to go to the, get a new platform and a new pulpit. Yeah. And I'm going to go to the coffee shop. And you know what? I'm going to just sit there until one of them says, you know what, GL? You've been coming here three months, and you've been talking to us, and you ain't cursed one time. Yeah. What's the deal? That's happened to me before. Oh, by the way, you know what I'm going to say? Can I tell you about Jesus? Because you know something, Logan? I ain't got nothing else. I would like to say, well, my mama taught me better than that. Good people don't talk like that. 
I don't cuss, I don't chew, and I don't go with the girls that do. Bless God, I'm holy. <laughs> we like to do that. Oh, I've never had a drink in my mouth. Oh. You know what, Brother Terrence? You know why I ain't never had a drink in my mouth? Because God's been good to me. He protected me. Because I come from a long line of wine O's and alcoholics. And Brother Ronnie, all I would have had to do is get a sip. And I'd have been done. But God kept me. I can't own that. I can't lay claim to that. That's who I am. Yes, sir. Um, you have to ask yourself, why was I here? Because it all starts with motivation. And if my motives were right and all hell breaks loose, you know what I need to do then? Lord, what you trying to teach me? Because that's who I am, a child of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord who are the called according to his purpose. So I'm in alignment. My motives are right. And it looks like nothing's going right. So I just got to pump the brakes and say, Lord, I'm listening. Now, Brother Cody, I'm telling you right now, I ain't the greatest at that. But I'm getting better. Because unfortunately, he's given me lots of practice. <laughs> But you know what, Brother Shannon? Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. As long as I keep trying to do it, and as long as I keep trying to fix it, and as long as I keep trying to figure it out, he sits back there and watches me. But as soon as I tell him, Lord, I need you. He says, what took you so long, boy? Now, you're still going to have to go through some stuff. And you're still going to have to act like a Christian when you go through it. But I'm going to be with you. So let's go. And you know what? I didn't feel goosebumps and I didn't run the aisles. But I got a confidence inside of me. Because I'm not doing. I'm being. Yes, ma'am. No, no, no. I didn't ever say we didn't have to do. I said, why are you doing it? We do with the right motivation. No, that's, I didn't say that ever. I didn't say that ever. It's not about not doing anything, except sometimes it is. Huh? Sometimes it is, because the Lord knows he can't trust me to do nothing in that situation. So just stay out of the way, because he told, what did he say to Moses? Stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord. But I ain't said nowhere in this tonight that you just don't do anything. I said, why are you doing it? What's the motivation behind? If I do it in the flesh, I'm doing it for the reward. If I do it in the spirit, I do it because that's who I am. Yes, and that's what happens is, is, but if we're in this mentality, the doing mentality, we think he is too. And he gets about two chances to not do, and then we're going to go find another path. Because it's not sustainable. Yeah, you can't, you can't sustain it at all. But the point is, is I got to wait on the harvest. And I want to plant today, water tomorrow, and pick it on the third day. And the Lord says, Brother Ronnie, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So when he's not doing like I want him to do, I'm going to do it myself. 
And you know what happens, Brother Terrence? I get wore out, give out, meaner than a snake, biting people's head off, frustrated, angry, faithless, and now the devil slides up beside me and says, is it really worth it? Look at this. You've been given an offering for two weeks. You had a flat tire. They stole the catalytic converter off your car. And gas has went up $6 a gallon. Is it really worth it? And if you're a doer, you will say, don't think so. I'm out. But if you realize, you know what, I'm a child of God. And when I got in this, I didn't get into it for the benefits. I got into it to be. What he makes me. Let me read this to you. Man, I was almost done early. Now, I, didn't, I had this message. This is, this is Wednesday. I had this lesson on Monday. I read Tony Dungy's Chuck Noll thing today. And Brother Shannon sent this to us. I can show you on my phone where he sent to us the mid-morning, maybe about dinner. Here's what it says. Trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. That's the NIV, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Listen to what it says. Matthew was an easy guy to hate because he was a money-grubbing tax collector. On behalf of the Roman Empire, he and his comrades extorted their fellow Jews far beyond what was owed to the government, and Matthew was perfectly cool with that. They charged them like if the taxes were $5, the publicans would charge them $500, and Rome said it's okay to do that. So they would pocket $450 and then pay the $50 taxes, and it was Jews doing it to their countrymen. That's who Matthew was. The disciple, Matthew. And Matthew was perfectly cool with that. The corrupt system worked in his favor. It was a great gig since Matthew was all about Matthew and excelled at doing exactly what Solomon warned against. Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to, deceive, to desist. On the contrary, look at this. I ain't making this up. Matthew was wearing himself out to get rich. He was trusting in his cleverness. Pre-Jesus Matthew's response would have been, so what, man? If you're going to wear yourself out doing something, it might as well be getting rich. Besides, if you can't trust yourself, who in the world can you trust? We get it, pre-Jesus Matthew. We get it. Because sadly, that's exactly the kind of self-reliant, succeed at all cost, follow your own truth ethos our world goes banana over. Our culture of consumerism feasts on it. I mean, who doesn't love a good rags to riches story? And if those riches were attained through disgustingly selfish, ill-gotten, greedy means, ah, who worries about the details? The de listen to this. You can't make this stuff up, man. The desire to be on top is like an electromagnetic force. You don't know what that's talking about? Beat everybody else out, climb up, yeah. do, and everybody knows it. So it can seize any one of us like a thumbtack sucked up by a magnet. So then think about what it would take to reverse that mighty pull once you'd been seized. What would cause you to willingly give it up, walk away from the money, and lay down the power? I love that. One of the most dramatic of plot twists for Matthew, it came in the form of two simple yet profound words. You know what they were? Follow me. Jesus went out and saw a tax collector sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. This was not a casual interaction. In a single moment, Matthew's need for more stuff 
was obliterated when he stood face to face with the author of life. All the trust in yourself and follow your own truth nonsense vaporized the second he locked eyes with truth and was called to follow the ultimate force, which is the desire to know God and love God in the flesh. Matthew, the easy-to-hate, crooked, money-grubbing tax collector, was standing in the presence of pure love, and it changed him instantly and radically. We get it, Matthew. We get it. Because beautifully, that's exactly the kind of Jesus-reliant, trust at all costs, follow me ethos, our Heavenly Father goes bananas over. So much so that he orchestrates a plot twist for each of us to respond to. And we too must have decide. God longs to make our crooked paths straight and script the ultimate rags to riches story, which sometimes involves trading our earthly riches for a few temporary rags. And Matthew was perfectly cool with that. He saw, look at this, he saw how much more this redemptive system worked in his favor. It was a great gig as Matthew became all about Jesus. I know that was a lot to read and you didn't catch all of it. But trust me when I tell you, that was this Bible study in one story. It's time to examine our motives. You say, well, I've been working hard and I've done this and I've, I've been harvesting, you know, corruption and, and the kids aren't doing good and, and, you know, we couldn't handle money good. My kids can't handle money good and now my grandkids, they're messed up too. What do you expect? I've been there. When I got married, I became the most popular man in southeast Missouri. Two famous in bar, J.C. Penney's, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, they turned me down. American Express, they turned me down, but they loved me anyway. And I got a credit card to every one of them. And as fast as they came in the mail, let me tell you what, as soon as they came in the mail, we popped it open and planned a trip. Until you know something, one day, Brother Cody, I had to decide. I can live like this forever. Or I can change. And you know whose way I can start doing it? God's way. God's way. Because I was, we pay our tithes if we can afford it. When I started doing it God's way, we pay our tithes first. First 10% of everything that comes into my house belongs to God. My family makes fun of me a little bit. Because when y'all give me a birthday offering, first 10% goes back in the church. Ain't that right, honey? Say, why you do it that way? Because I, when I was doing, it didn't work all that good. But when I started being, and you know what happens when I be? I trust him. Here's the conclusion. Say, okay, you, done, you got me. It all messed up. All wrong. I've been reaping. Kids ain't good. Marriage ain't good, job ain't good, drive an old car, it ain't good, bicycle broke down, it ain't no good, hole in the front porch, it ain't no good. So now what, big boy? You done brought it all to life that I've been, been reaping the bad harvest. So what do I do? Very simple. Are you ready? You ready? Yeah. Follow me. Because Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Say, so, well, how do I do that? I wish, I wish you would ask me, Lord, 
I'm done. I'm done. I believe your word. And I'm going to stand on it. <laughs> it's a process. It ain't all going to be fixed in one prayer meeting tonight. But you know what he'll say? Follow me. Follow me and I will make you what I need you to be. Let's stand. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your faithfulness. The Wednesday nights, we're going to start up in another series very shortly. We're going to, my plan is to go to the book of Jude. You might want to read that. It's a long one. You may have some trouble staying with it till you get done. I think it's about 30 verses in one chapter. But we're going to use that to launch us into a holiness series. And we'll probably be on that the rest of the year. Um, and it's all going to feed off of this, what we're having now. But I'll be gone on vacation in a couple of weeks. You're going to get to hear almost the whole team preach. And uh, I've just told them, stop doing so good when I'm gone. <laughs> no, I didn't tell them that at all. But uh, I love you. I hope you've got something out of this. I, I hope you have got some things. No, you don't have to get it all figured out right now. But take that hand down home. Lay it out there before the Lord and tell him, I'm ready to follow you. Now help me, lead me. Any announcements? They're in your bulletin, those that are important. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for truth and the power of the Holy Ghost. I ask you, God, that you will let this be not deceived, be on our mind, be at the forefront of our mind. Let us have an awareness that we haven't had before. I pray it, God, right now, a spiritual awareness that anybody who falls prey to deception, they have to wade through this teaching to do it first. I pray, God, that you bring it to all of our memory, all of our minds. I, I, I have failed even during this series, God, the things I've preached, but I don't want to. I want to continue to submit myself to you and find the perfect way to be who I am in you. I pray, God, that that huge spirit of humility sweeps into this house and, and that spirit of faith sweeps into this house. And we all realize that you, when you said, come unto me, you meant every one of us. Let us do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.